Okay, so now we're gonna work on um, some examples here. Uh, so just remember that these two famous limits will come in handy uh, when we're getting a zero over zero. We always try direct substitution first. I wanna remember that for any limit, any type of limit. And if we're still getting zero over zero, some of those fancy algebra tricks that we learned in previous sections can't be done on some of these trig functions but we're gonna remember these two famous limits that end up coming up a lot. So we can try to transform algebraically what we're looking at into one of these or part of what we're looking at into one of these so we can um, apply this along with properties of limits uh, to still find the limit, even if it's a zero over zero situation. So it's kind of like an algebraic simplification idea. Um, and so I wanna kind of be clear on that. We're going to try to do some algebraic manipulation to make it look like one of these. Um, so of course we're going to start off with some where direct substitution just works and we're good to go. You won't get zero over zero. You'll get a number. We're not going to do too many of those um, because those really aren't that difficult. All right. So if we look at number one, here's an example where direct substitution works. So I'm going to try plugging in zero into the function and I'm going to get e to the zero times cosine of zero uh, over four. Uh, and so cosine of zero is one, e to the zero is also one, so we're getting one times one, so it's one fourth. There's our limit, direct substitution worked. This is just a reminder that no matter what type of limit you see, even though it looks like maybe one of these weird special ones with like, you know, a sine and a cosine over like an X or something. This sort of has that same look. You got to do direct substitution first. Do not forget about direct substitution. All right, so let's try it here. If I do direct substitution, I get sine of uh, four times zero all over zero. So that's going to be equal to sine of zero over zero um, and so now what does that equal sine of zero is what zero over zero so we have our kind of our zero over zero situation here so I can't really do any other that's that's obviously not a number I'm just showing that we try direct substitution we arrive at zero over zero I can't do any of the other algebra I learned from other sections so I look like is it of the form of one of these other special ones? And please note, these special ones are when theta equals zero only. So that's the first thing you have to verify. <coughs> it's not if theta is going to pi or whatever, or to infinity, right? It's only when theta goes to zero. And then this one seems to look like, this function here seems to look of, like it's of this form, where a is four and b is a one here in time because uh, one times theta right so it looks like it's just going to be four over one and there's not really any kind of reasoning there other than you know your famous limit okay so that's that one there was no manipulation to make it be in the right form uh it just already kind of is in the right form so let's look at this one let's try direct substitution i get sine of two times zero all over three times zero so i get sine that's equal to sine of zero over zero sine of zero is of course zero so i get my zero over zero once again i verify this part seems to be of this form over here right um i do have to verify that the variable i don't know what color did i use blue that part is approaching zero, so that checks out. So this seems to be our famous sine limit again, where your a is two and your b is three. For so for the sine one, you know sine of a x, sine of x over x is one. That's how I think of it. I just remember sine of x over x as x approaches zero. I remember that as equal to one, and then these coefficients here come into play, like whatever they are, a and b. Um, so that's how I remember it. So this is a sine of x over x1. I'm saying x over x, even though I know there's a two and a three there. So I know the answer is two thirds. All right, so uh, let's look at number four. <clears throat> we try direct substitution. 
we get 2 times sine of uh, 5 times 0 all over 3 times 0. So we get 2 times sine of, z sine of 0 is 0. 3 times 0 is 0. So I get 0 over 0. We're there again. Now this one <clears throat> looks sort of like this, but I'm going to argue, well, first of all, yeah, we should confirm theta goes to zero. It looks like our famous limit of sine here, okay? But I'm going to argue that it's not. It's close. Notice that we do not have a coefficient here. In our version, it's got to be a one there, and we have this two sticking out here. So here's how we're going to think of this. The limit as theta goes to zero, I can pull that two out and write it as two times sine of five theta over three theta. This is just a constant or a coefficient. By our properties of limits, we know that like, I'm gonna just re recall, oh, what the heck did I do? I'm gonna have you recall this. I'm gonna write it on the side in a different color. Um, and for properties of limits, we had like the limit as x goes to some value c of a times a function is going to be equal to a times the limit as x goes to c of that function. This does not seem like a big deal, but this will come up. This is the underpinnings of a lot of things that we do in calculus for shortcuts because the stuff that we're going to learn in calculus is defined through limits. And understanding the properties of limits really well helps you understand some of these algebraic moves that I'm going to pull off later in calculus. Like I'm just going to look at something and go, oh, that's a constant. I'm just going to bring it along for the ride is what I say. So like in other words, I've got this constant here. It's just going to come along for the ride and I'm going to multiply. I'm going to do my answer separately. I'm not going to really deal with the A. I'm just going to do the limit of F of X only. I'm going to do this part, bring the coefficient along for the ride and then multiply it by the answer later. You'll hear me saying that all next year nonstop. Uh, there's a couple of steps involved here and it's based on properties of limits. And this is a property. It just says you're, if you're doing the limit uh, of a constant times a function, you can pull the constant out and just do the limit of the function and then multiply the A in later. Okay, so because of that property, that's why we need to kind of isolate this two out here as a constant. We pull it out of the numerator and then really we pull it all the way through outside the limit by, the pro by this property. So it's going to be two times the limit as theta approaches zero of sine, because this is your function, right? That's like your constant. This is like your giant f of x right here, right? So now I can just do the deal with the function, sine of five theta over three theta. So I can deal, I'm gonna put brackets even though we don't need them. I can deal with this function uh, in the brackets here. I can deal with that by itself. Just do that limit and then multiply the answer by two. So again, the language you'll hear me start to use is, well, that's just a constant, so we bring it along for the ride. Meaning, while I do the limit of the other stuff, two, we just keep track of that too. You can do it when you're multiplying by a constant. That is a property of limits. Very, very important. I know it doesn't seem like such a big deal right now. It will become a huge deal later. So now, I notice that um, this is the limit goes to theta, and this looks like my famous sine limit, right? It is, it matches this form here. So the answer is gonna be those coefficients, A over B. So uh, this limit is two times five over three, so it's 10 thirds. All right, so these are sort of more the basic ones. Now we're gonna get a little more tricky here, all right? So um, I try direct substitution. It's important to try that every time. So tangent of zero over zero. There's a couple of ways to evaluate this. If you like, you could think of tangent as sine of zero over cosine of zero. Maybe you know what tangent of zero is off the top of your head. Maybe you have to write it as sine over cosine. Either way works. So sine of zero uh, is zero. Cosine of zero is one. And then zero over one is zero. So yeah, we're arriving at zero over zero. <clears throat> Except this, okay, so let's let's do it this way. Sorry, I keep forgetting. We verify that it's as, whoops, I wanted the highlighter that color, not the pen. We verify this guy is good. Theta is going, the variable is going to zero. This part, however, what color was I doing? For sine, I was doing that purplish, reddish thing, okay? 
But this is a tangent. It's not a sine or a cosine. So this is not one of our favorite, um, favorite, famous limits. So we need to try to manipulate this to turn it into one. So one thing we could do is we can say the limit as theta approaches zero of tangent. Uh, so I'm going to change that to sine of theta over cosine of theta over theta. Okay. Um, and then there's a couple of ways that I can deal with this. So now I can think of this as theta over one. So I have a complex fraction. So I'm going to say, I'm going to do it this way. I know there's a couple ways to go. So you might say like, well, Mr. D, I can do this a different way. That's cool. It works. There's, there's, I'm telling you there's more than one way. This is kind of the step-by-step -step process. You might know what I'll call shortcuts. Like if you just, could, some people, especially after you do one or two of these, you'll kind of see a couple steps ahead and that's great. I'm going to go through every single step right now, uh, just so you can see them. And, and if you need to show all the steps all the time, that's great too. It's just good sound logical thinking. All right. So what I'm going to do to simplify a complex fraction is I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal. All right. So now I have this as the limit as theta equals, I'm oh, sorry, theta equals theta goes to zero as theta approaches zero sine of theta over theta times cosine of theta. I just kind of write the theta in front when I multiply them. All right. So the issue still remains. Look, I didn't really do much algebraically. I'm going to stop here and try direct substitution and see if it works. Well, if I plug in zero, sine of zero is zero. If I plug in zero on the bottom, uh, I get zero for the theta times cosine of zero is one, still zero over zero. So I didn't solve the problem. And you're not going to be able to. Those old like algebraic methods where uh, what's the problem? Dividing by zero. Please keep in mind, dividing by zero is the issue. That's what makes this number undefined. There's two factors on the bottom. There's theta and cosine of theta. When I plug zero into those for theta, this is zero and this is one. So which one is the issue? The theta is the issue, not the cosine theta. If I can get rid of this theta, the cosine theta on the bottom is not going to be a problem. It's not going to be zero, right? So we're okay. It's this guy that we've got to eliminate. We've got to get rid of that theta somehow. And there's no way to cancel it. That's the old methods. But what I can do is I can now separate this into two fractions times each other. I can think of this as like sine of theta times one if I like. Watch. Sine of theta, uh, the limit as theta goes to zero of sine of theta over theta times one over cosine of theta. Okay, now again, you can skip steps here, but I'm not going to. So I can think of this properties of limits. If I have a limit as like x approaches c of f of x times g of x, properties of limit says I can do the limit of each product separately and multiply the answers later. And that's exactly what we're going to do. All right, so you see how like if I have the limit of a product, uh, the properties say that's equal to the product of the limits, meaning you can do the limits separately and then multiply the answers. All right, huge property. So I'm going to do that here. I'm having the limit of a product, right? One thing I'll call this whole function f times another function g. I can break that up into the product of the limits. So it's going to be one limit times another limit, right? So as theta goes to zero, as theta goes to zero, sine of theta over theta times one over cosine of theta. So remember that theta in the denominator is a problem and I can't cancel it out, but what I can do is write a separate limit that turns into one of our famous limits, right? So um, I see, I confirm that the variable goes to zero and that this is my famous limit. So all I have to do is get the problem. This is the problem. If I can get it involved in a famous limit, I can essentially eliminate it <clears throat> I'm not because I've already proven what this limit goes to. This limit goes to one because the coefficients are whoops, one and one <clears throat> times. Now this one, I can do direct substitution. So if I plug in zero, I get one on top and then cosine of zero on the bottom is one. So one times one is one. All right. So we're not really canceling out like before the factor. That's an issue. We're just rewriting. So it's involved in a famous limit. And that's kind of our way of getting rid of it. That's really the key here. And that's what we're going to practice going forward. We're going to have things that don't look like our famous limit. We do some fancy footwork 
and we use some properties of limits and we can tease out out of that we can tease out a famous limit that's going to involve our issue in the denominator whatever's making the denominator zero remember that's always your issue whatever's making the denominator zero we can tease that out get it involved in a famous limit and just do our memorization we memorize that this limit is one and now it's not a problem for the rest of this limit over here we can evaluate it by direct substitution that is the play here okay so we look at this guy it does not look like a famous limit um, it sort of does if you had to guess it wouldn't be the one that we've been working with exclusively the sine one it looks more like one minus cosine over theta right it's pretty darn close so we could factor um, first of all I should remind you we always 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 need to check direct substitution first you never know it might work that was an FRQ last year um, not in 2020's exam but in 2019's exam they made like this thing where students saw this it looked like something that they've done algebra on before and they did all this complex algebra and by the way you'll still get the right answer if you perform it correctly but they made it a really tricky one it was really hard to get through all the complex algebra um, to be honest with you like the first time I did it I kind of made a mistake with the algebra um, but uh, also to be honest with you I knew to do direct substitution right away but I just tried to do the algebra to make sure you know if for students that did it like we can explain the steps um, and I actually made a couple mistakes on it twice um, but the point here is they will try and trick you they'll give you one that you look at and go all right I'm just gonna start doing the algebra on it uh, when you could have done the problem in 10 seconds if you just did direct substitution and I'm sure that many students spent like five to ten minutes on this limit uh, so always try it it's not gonna work here but let's just do it anyway 2 minus 2 cosine of 0 squared remember that's what cosine squared means all over 0 so that means we got 2 minus 2 times Cosine of 0 is 1, and 1 squared is 1 over 0. So this becomes 2 minus 2, which is 0 over 0. Okay, we've confirmed it doesn't work. I shouldn't circle it. It's not the answer. So the old things where we like try to factor and cross off the theta aren't going to work. I'm not going to be able to factor a theta out of this thing and cross it off. That would have been from a couple sections ago. So what I'm going to have to do is tease out that famous limit. And remember, this feels like 1 minus cosine of theta. This feels like 1 minus cosine of theta over theta. So we want to try to somehow tease that out. So the first thing I'm going to do, seems to me it's pretty obvious here to factor out a 2. That probably looks like a good place to start. And that, you would say, like this part, you might say, Mr. D, this part looks like our famous limit and you would be wrong actually you wouldn't you'd be correct it does look like it but it's not there's a major difference between the two this one is 1 minus cosine squared we can't have that so we have to go a little further 2 times that's a difference of squares the, per the perfect square of 1 is 1 and 1. The perfect square of cosine squared is cosine theta and cosine theta. And that's all over theta. Remember, we do plus and we do minus. So now I see three factors on top, three things that I multiply by. And by the way, the issue is here on the bottom. This theta is what is 0 when I plug in 0. So I can't cross it off with another theta up top. What I need to do is get it involved in, a, in the famous limit. I erased too much there. So this theta is definitely the problem. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna start it. We gotta get that involved in the famous limit. And we're looking for one minus cosine. Oh, here it is right here. So that's gonna be our famous limit. Now you've got two other factors up top, so you can make other fractions. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna say the limit as theta approaches zero of two times one plus cosine of theta all over one times because this is like theta times one you could say if you want and you're gonna break this up times one minus cosine of 
theta over theta. So once again, just trying to keep track of this, there's our fav famous limit. I keep saying favorite. So the, the, I put the brackets to say it's the limit of all of this. So this is our limit of a product. I've got a function times another function, and this second function is our famous one. So the limit of a product by properties of limits can be written as the product of limits, two limits times each other, right? So the limit of a product is equal to the product of limits. So this one here, I've got two times one plus, oh, wait a second. I'm gonna pull that constant two out. The two's gonna just come along for the ride. Oh, this eraser, is it like the massive one? Yeah, I gotta calm down on that eraser there. Okay, so I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna yank that two outside and bring it along for the ride on that first limit. So make this a little neater. One plus cosine of theta over one times the limit, and that's our famous one. All right, so now we can do the product of the limits. The theta was the issue in the denominator, so this limit should be good to go now. It doesn't have the theta in it. I can do direct substitution on that limit. So let's go ahead and do that. Two comes along, that constant comes along for the ride, times whatever this limit is. So I do direct substitution, I plug in the zero, cosine of zero is zero, so I get one over one, times, this is a famous limit. First of all, I verify theta goes to zero. I was using what, this light blue? And this is our famous limit, one minus cosine of theta over theta. And we determined it doesn't matter what a and b are. There could be coefficients there, it doesn't matter. It's always zero because zero times those coefficients will still be zero. So that part is zero, this limit. And so now it's multiplication, so that zero just zeros out everything. And so the answer to number six is zero. Okay. Moving along, this is a fun one. Um, there's a couple of ways to kind of look at this one, but again, I'll try to bring you through step by step. You may know like a faster way to do it or something, but I'm gonna do the way that I think like you want, you need to see it the first time. Okay, so, um, Notice the difference, this is huge. The difference between when I break these up from here. Notice the difference between this function and this function, because I'm gonna break them up by denominator. Huge difference. If we were live in class, which was my intention to do these together, I would ask you what you think the difference is. And someone would notice that in this one, the numerator is all multiplication. It's two times this stuff times that stuff, they're called factors, right? Here we'd notice it's all addition or subtraction. It's like one minus this stuff plus that stuff. So how do you break up a fraction? If you have multiplication, A times B times C over one denominator, D, you could break it up as A over D times B over one times C over one. You could put the D with that any one you want. You could say A over one times B over D times C over one. Right, the D can only go underneath one of those when it's multiplication, and then the other ones would get ones. Because think about multiplying fractions. You multiply the top, you get your A, B, C. You multiply the bottom, D times one times one, you get D. But adding fractions is quite different. They have to have the same denominator. So when you're unadding fractions, which is what I'm gonna say here. So I've got like, if I have like one minus X plus Y, I'll say it that way, over Z, I could say that it's one over z minus, I hate when the thing starts skipping like this, minus x over z plus y over z. Because think backwards, if I were to add these together, these three fractions, they all have to have the same denominator. And then I can add the numerators, one minus x plus y. And that's how I get to this. So we're gonna unadd fractions. Here we're sort of unmultiplying fractions. Here we're unadding this fraction. And I'm gonna do it in a special way that, um, well, there's a reason why I'm doing it in a special way. I should actually do this first. I forgot what I told you. We always, always, always try direct substitution first and make sure it's zero over zero. So I have one minus cosine of zero plus
plus sine of 2 times 0, so that's just 0, over 0. So it's 1 minus cosine of 0 is 1, plus sine of 0 is 0, all over 0. So we're getting 0 over 0. Yeah, 0 over 0. I shouldn't circle it, not the answer. But yes, okay, 0 over 0, confirmed. We're looking for a famous limit. Uh, and this one's interesting because it's addition. That theta is causing the problem, right? That's the zero in the denominator. So that theta has got to get involved in our special limit or one of our um, famous limits. The, the thing is, when it's multiplication up top, I only need to put that theta in with one of the fractions and the other ones will be good to go. But when it's addition, that denominator ends up in every fraction. So every single fraction will have theta in it. So I've got an, every fraction has to be a famous fraction. So I've got three numerators here. So I could do this. 1 over theta minus cosine over theta plus sine of 2 theta over theta. And the problem here is this is a famous limit. So that's good to go. I can get an answer for that. These two are not. I would still get undefined because I'd have divide by zero. But what if I didn't break it up into three separate, maybe just two fractions? I leave these two stuck together as one. So if I were to kind of add these back together, yeah, I know it's subtraction. Or if I say when I unadd these fractions, if I think of this as one of the numerators and that as the other, I get two famous limits. Limits. I get one minus cosine of theta over theta plus sine of two theta over theta. Now. Again, I'm showing you every single step. In the future, you want to skip steps, be my guest. I've got the limit of a sum. By properties of limits, I could say that's the same thing as the sum of the limits. So if I have two limits, right? Like if I have a limit of a sum, I can say it's the sum of the limits. I can do each one individually and then add their answers later. Well, this one looks like a famous limit. This one is also a famous limit. I was trying to keep them color coded with the highlighting. So first we confirm, yeah, the variable goes to zero, so it could be our famous limit. This one, I can't remember the colors that I did. Purple. And this one, yeah, was that bluish, that light blue? Right? Did I do it right? Did I have it? I did. All right, so they're famous limits. Uh, this one always goes to zero. This one goes to the co one times whatever the coefficients are, so two and a one. So it's zero plus two, so that is indeed two. All right, two more to go. This was way longer than I intended, I'm sorry. We're at 28 minutes. Okay, uh, again, the, you know, the last two are going to have some, some fancy footwork to them, so uh, let's... Let's try to do these as quick as possible. In order to cut down time, I'm gonna tell you that when we do direct substitution, we get zero over zero. You should probably plug in zero if you're not kosher on that and make sure that you get uh, zero over zero. Um, moving along, we now want to, because my numerator is addition, I don't really see a way to factor that. Like if I could common factor difference of two squares, I'll do that, but since I can't, I'm going to do what I call unadding these fractions. So when you unadd fractions, that means they keep their same denominator because you need the same denominator to add fractions. So we're kind of going backwards through that addition of fractions process. So we unadd our fractions and something cool happens here on the first one. Anything over itself is one. So, oh, by the way, I'm gonna use my properties of limits first, sorry. So if I have the limit of a sum, two things added together, it's going to be the sum of the limits. Once again, that's going to be huge later. I'm going to refer back to these properties all year long. Um, oh, keep in mind, when we did do direct substitution, the thing that's causing the problem, uh, cosecant is 1 over sine, and sine of 0 is 0, so that's an issue. But the other main thing is this theta is causing the problem. I need that theta involved in a famous limit. Uh, so that's going to be our goal moving forward. All right, so this part right here, anything divided by itself is 1. So this limit becomes very easy. 
it's just going to be 1. It doesn't matter what theta is approaching because there's no theta in the function. The limit of a constant is just the constant itself. So that part's easy. And actually, I'll hold off on doing that because we're going to have more steps to do here. Uh, so this one's 1 over theta times what I'll call that as cosecant is 1 over sine theta. Right? And I'm going to just try to undo this complex fraction. Like So how would you simplify this? Actually, I don't want to keep rewriting this. Let's just, you can calculate it in bits. So like I'll do this. I know that that's 1. Here it's still the limit. So I have to still write the limit because we haven't calculated it yet. And it's going to be 1 over theta times sine of theta over 1. Because I can kind of, instead of dividing by this fraction, I can multiply by the reciprocal. And so it's going to be 1 plus the limit as theta goes to 0 of sine of theta because I multiply the numerators. And then I multiply the denominators. Hey, there's my famous limit. Uh, so I've got, I confirm that the variable is going to 0. That's what it has to be to be a famous limit. Uh, I'm forgetting the color coding I did again. I think this one was the blue kind, right? So that bad boy right there is going to be equal to the coefficients 1 over 1. So I've got 1 plus 1. This limit equals 2. There's 1. This whole fancy limit is 1. Last one. Okay. So this guy... Uh, yeah, it looks like maybe I should unadd these fractions, or I should say unsubtract. But I noticed something very nice here that in the numerator I can do some kind of factoring. Here I noticed like there wasn't really any factoring to do because this was just plus one. If this were squared, maybe I could do like sum of squares or something, but it wasn't. Here I noticed there's two terms, sine of x and then sine x cosine x. Uh, I noticed that each term has a common factor, so I'm going to factor that out. That's usually how these ones go. If you can factor the top, try it. So if I factor out a sine of x, what's left over? Well, if I divide a sine of x out of the first term, uh, that's just sine of x divided by sine of x, so I get 1. If I divide a sine of x out of this term, the sine of x go, goes away. Again, you have a sine of x over sine of x is 1, but you still have that cosine left, so it's minus cosine of x all over x squared. All right? Now, um, I'm going to unmultiply these fractions because now the numerator, when it's factored, as soon as you factor the numerator, it's now multiplication. We like multiplication better because I don't have to apply the denominator to every part of the fraction. Uh, so it seems that I have a famous limit going on here, and I need the x squared is the problem. So um, I need to get it involved in a famous limit. But notice that my famous limits do not have a theta squared on the bottom. They're both just theta. So what I'm going to do is actually make two famous limits here because it's x squared. So when I unmultiply these fractions, remember the bottom can really be thought of as x times x. The top, I've got these two things multiplied together and these two things. So I'm going to break those into two fractions. I am going to sip, skip a step here. So we know that if it's a limit of a product, it can be the product of the limit. So I'm going to write it as two different limits. The first fraction is going to be sine of x over x because I'm bringing this x and putting it here and this x and putting it there. And hey, we have our two famous limits in one problem. There they are. I'm not going to go through all the steps of identifying why they're the famous limit. I think you have it by now. So this is a famous limit and we know that that's going to go to 1. This is a famous limit. We know it's going to go to 0. 0 times 1 is 0. All right, so good luck on your practice. I will see you at office hours if you have any questions.